So I'm actually going to wait one more minute because we still have, we would like to have Nick Sumner, Rick Chase, Greta. Greta's here. Goody. Okay. Uh, Nick Sumner and Rick Chase and Council Member Cathcart is not quite with us yet. Doesn't look like. So I'm going to give Rick. those folks this a chance to chime in. Oh, Rick, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Here. Oh, there you are. Calling user three. Not on the computer this time. Nope, not to the time. All right. Um, mine keeps mine keeps breaking up, so I figured I'll just call call in and well, watch it on TV. Well, so everybody was talking seconds. about how young you looked, Rick, when you were on the computer. And and, and they're and they're and they're rightly so, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but I'm but, but but I'm watching all you all on TV right now. So, uh huh. But well, it's about at like least an eight second. Your TV, I hope. Okay. It's about an eight. It's about an eight second away, though. All right. Well, I think I will go ahead and call the meeting to order and hope that Nick Sumner and Michael Cathcart can join us. Everybody else from part the park board is present. Uh, so, um, are there any additions or deletions? Well, first of all, let me do it officially. I will call uh, to order the park board meeting of Thursday, March 11th by WebEx. And uh, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, is there any public comment? Actually, we don't see anybody from the public on the call. So we will move to the consent agenda. You have on the consent agenda four items. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? No. Hearing none, I will make a motion that we move that the consent agenda be approved as presented. Do I have a second? Yes, I'll second that. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 And raise a hand and whatever. Aye. Very good. All right. Opposed? Okay. The consent agenda has passed. We have with us today Dave Nelson from Land Expressions. And I asked Land Expressions to attend this meeting because I wanted to thank them. Um, you know, this windstorm hit, this last one, hit um, us harder than the first one, uh, the one that got more national press and the one that got more national help with funding. And uh, this one really, in particular, nailed parks. I think it had Comstock in its bullseye. Uh, but it was hit also um, in Manitou and other places in the city. And in an era in which companies are having to watch their bottom line and be so careful, Dave Nelson, who is known to many park and rec staff as a mentor of many landscape architects on staff um, and, and in the community, um, stepped forward with land expressions and helped us out pro bono and got those stumps that those locks cut and those stumps maneuvered in such a way that they could be removed and just stepped up to the plate. And that kind of community mindedness, especially in an era in which people are watching their bottom line, is just way and above board, I think. So Dave, I wanted on behalf of the park board and the park and rec staff to thank you. I wanted to thank you very much. And I wish we could give you a round of applause and the silly little stickers, but hooray, thank you so much. Uh, for what Land Expressions did, I want to publicly acknowledge our appreciation for your community mindedness. So thank you very, very much for being such a team player. Thank you. So, all right, we will uh, move then to the financial report and Mark Buning. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Today, uh, since uh, we got a, we didn't present a financial report last month, you get two of them this month. And so we will be presenting a brief high level look at the 2020 year end and also 2021 year through February. So let me share my screen and okay. So start off with the, obviously the year end of 2020. So our first slide here, we see here the graph reflects 
that our 2020 expenditures were significantly below our budget. And that budget, of course, is based upon an average of the last two years. And this has been a, a pattern we have consistently been seeing since last March when the economy experienced you know, all of the widespread shutdowns due to COVID. And uh, due to our, um, our greatly reduced demand for temp seasonal labor, our reduced capital expenditures, and really, really uh, exceptional tight cost containment, department-wide, our 2020 total expenditures were approximately 70% of our 2019 total expenditures. So it had a, definitely a significant impact. Our second graph, we look at our revenues. And it says we also we see a, um, a significant re reductions in revenue in 2020. Uh, overall, our revenues were about five million dollars less than in 2019. And again, this is due to, to our greatly reduced revenues from our curtailment of our revenue generating parks activities and reduced grant revenues for capital projects. Moving on to the third picture. Hopefully here, let's see, there we go. Um, our third graph here, we see we're comparing our total 2020 revenues to our 2020 total expenditures. And then we finished 2020 with approximately $1.4 million more revenues and expenditures. And then hope you know, that's, that's very, that this, Positive contribution to our fund balance reserves will look forward to assist us as we in, as we anticipate a reduced or flat general fund transfers in 2022 and 2023 due to our reduction ex in expenditures kind of across the board at the, at the city. Are there any questions about 2020 year end for the parks fund before we take a look at the Gulf fund? All right, hearing none, we look at our first graph here for the Gulf Fund. We see in this graph the 2020 actual expenditures were significantly below the historical budget average. 2020 expenditures were about $97,000 less than in 2019 year end. So again, a lot of the same thing, holding, holding costs across the board, being very careful about what was being expended. Uh, significant savings in temp diesel labor. So we see that reflected here. Looking at our revenues now, their, their 2020 revenues reflect a great year at the city's golf courses. The 2020 revenues actually exceeded the historical budget average and exceeded our 2019 actual revenues by over $500,000. The year-end balance of the facility improvement fee was uh, reserved was over a million dollars, and this, of course, is reserved for future debt service payments on the loan on the SIP loan taken for the rehabilitation of the golf course irrigation systems. And then our last graph here for 2020, is this reflects our actual revenues to actual expenditures. The 2020 revenues over expenditures were approximately $960,000. In comparison, the 2019 revenues over expenditures were approximately $350,000, a difference in improvement of over $600,000. Are there any questions before we move into 2021? All right, here we go. Our Introduction to February through the, these are the financials for January and February, year to date for 2021. So our first graph here reflects our actual expenditures through February and actuals were about 84% of the budget. And then I wanted to, to note that throughout this month's presentations, we'll be comparing current time period to equivalent time periods that were not shut down due to COVID. Um, that all those shutdowns happened in 2020 near the end of March. So we're, you know, again comparing some some different um, circumstances and situations. So looking at our second graph, we see our year-to-date revenues compared to the budget average. They're quite close, with 2020 actuals about 94% of the budget. Expenditures through February 2020 
um, actually, uh, I'm sorry, revenues through February were about uh, $269,000 less than last year at the same time. Again, last year in the same time period, there were no, there were no, oh, none of our revenue generating programs were shut down. And looking at our third graph here, we see this graph compares actual revenues to actual expenditures. Revenues through February exceeded expenditures by about $1.4 million. Now, this again is about $240,000 less than last year comparing the same time period. But this is due primarily to the timing of the general fund transfers to the park fund. So we had an additional transfer last year, which reflected a greater revenues. So are there any questions about 1400 before we move into the Gulf Fund? Okay, hearing none, we'll look at our first graph for the, our first slide for the Gulf Fund. And that actual expenditures in February exceeded the budget average by about $25,000. And then again, this is due mostly to temp seasonal costs, overtime and operational expenses incurred for the, Janu for the cleanup of the January windstorm. So that did definitely impact our budget. Now the next graph shows total revenues through, through February that are only slightly below the historical average. Uh, revenues were about $50,000 less than last year, um, but in 2020, there was also there was some revenue collected from course openings in February, and but this that difference was offset because we had some a strong 2021 preseason sales, which um, mitigated some of that difference from. And since we haven't, this does not reflect any revenue from course openings as as it, as we did, as we had in 2020. Now, our third graph here, we see here that expenditures through February exceeded revenues by about $29,000. And I mentioned earlier, this is due primarily to our windstorm costs and expenses incurred for preparation for season openings, which I believe we've had some openings already this month. Um, are there any questions about the Gulf funds before we take a last look at the state of the bond fund or the bond project? Yeah, yeah Mark, this is Rick. I just have a quick question. Is sure. the Gulf, do, do we have a ballpark figure of what the total cost might be on the golf courses for the cleanup and the repairs like at Downriver Golf Course of all the fencing and the, the foyer that got, you know, the tree fell into? And all of that, we we have collected some costs that we have submitted for estimates. Um, I don't recall exact. If I gave a number, it would be wrong. I can't think of what it, what we were anticipating for the estimated cost of that. I kind of okay. throw that question out. Does anybody else remember? Uh, Rick, we'll get you some numbers. We've. We didn't really separate golf and the rest of parks since we were all just kind of working together, ops teams working on the golf courses and vice versa. So um, we do have some estimates on the capital repairs. So um, we can get you some of those updated numbers, but they're tens of thousands of dollars so far that have been expensive. Okay. Yeah, yeah and what we've encouraged so far has been mainly mainly labor costs and some uh, costs for material and supplies that, that we needed to immediately do, tree cleanup and turf repair and things like that. But there are some capital costs that will be um, lingering into the rest of the year. Okay, thanks. Any additional questions? All right, looking at our last slide, um, this reflects the, the status of the Riverfront bond project through February. And then we see here the remaining balance in February after our actual expenditures and our encumbered or, or committed funds is about $677,000. So that concludes the financial report. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, Mark. Well done. Thank you.
you know, golf continues to be the star. And I know that I've heard a lot of buzz about people signing up for lessons. So I think that's going to continue to be a revenue generating, generating program for us. So the next um, budget, uh, the next action item rather on the agenda is a special action item. It is a park board regular standing committee meeting notice action item. And for those of you who are wondering why this isn't under bylaws, the, um, this doesn't concern bylaws as much as the notices for the meetings in, in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, so let me uh, give you a little background. Currently, each of the park board's regular standing committee meetings are noticed as special meetings of the park board. This practice was initially employed in order to maintain Open Public Meeting Act compliance in the event a quorum of the board, that's six, uh, was in attendance at any given committee meeting. By noticing regular meetings as special meetings, additional stipulations are applicable regarding what may be discussed at these regular meetings. As a special meeting, no discussion item may take place on an item, no discussion may take place on an item not noticed on the agenda, and no changes may be made to the agenda within 24 hours of the meeting start time. So it really kind of ties our hands in a way. If we need to move an item from discussion to action because something you know, has come up and we need to get moving faster. These special meeting conditions can impact the efficiencies and flow of the communication allowed under OPMA for regular meetings. So this recommendation that I'm about to make will allow the standing committees of the park board to be noticed as regular meetings as long as the meeting is convened at the respective regular committee's scheduled time. For example, golf, finance, land, recreation, riverfront park, and urban forestry all meet on a regular monthly basis. You'll notice that um, the Joint Arts Commission and the Development Volunteer Committee are not in bylaws, are not part of this list because they don't meet on a regular basis. So the special notice would still apply to them. So I'd like to uh, move that we omit the special meeting of the Spokane Park Board notice from the standing Park Board Committee meeting notices and agendas, as long as the meeting is held at a regularly scheduled time for that committee. Is there a second? Okay. okay, thank you, Kevin. And any discussion or questions on this? All right, it's a procedural thing. So all those in favor of this special action item, Signify by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? All right, no opposed, so thank you. It passes unanimously. And we will move on then to our committee reports and Rick Chase with Urban Forestry. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, I'm gonna ask Angel Spell, to, you know, she's gonna, give a report. We don't get, usually get a lot of reports from urban forestry, but they did a, for the, for our canopy, Gonzaga University did, did a great study for us and it was really, really interesting. So I asked her to come, come to this meeting, which she comes anyways, and to give, to go ahead and give the report of that. So go ahead, Angel. Thank you, Rick. I am going to attempt to share my screen. Please let me know if I fail or succeed. How's that? Looks, Looks good. good. Looks good. Anything else? Looks good. So I'll start with a little discussion about the, the who and why of this study. So I have, a, I have a connection at Gonzaga with the environmental science instructor there, and uh, he has uh, a lot of senior students who are looking for capstone projects in their final year. And four of his students really wanted to do this canopy study. And um, so along with, the, along with the urban forestry program staff and these four Gonzaga students and, um, and a particular uh, software modeling program that we like to use called iTree, um, we were able to make this happen in a, in a fairly short amount of time. They started on it as, as a fall project. So the reason why is um, I think fairly obvious, at least to me, all of the benefits that our urban tree canopy 
provide to our residents in terms of social and health benefits, um, environmental benefits, economic benefits, uh, the cooling of, of urban heat islands, the storage of carbon, mitigation of stormwater, improvements to air quality, all of those things. So um, we have an ambitious initiative to increase our tree canopy across the city. Moving on to a little bit of the how this was done. I mentioned iTree. iTree is a, is a software modeling uh, tool set that was developed by the USDA Forest Service with many partners. And um, it, uses, it uses data from uh, many different sources along with of the data that we generate. The way this particular program works for Canopy is it uses Google Earth and it randomizes points across the city. One thing that the students did was use um, was scale this down to the neighborhood level. So they did 29 different studies for the 29 neighborhood council districts. And that gives us really um, you know, neighborhood scale specific information about tree canopy. And it also gives us a lot of information about disparities across the city in terms of tree canopy cover. So when we process this data, um, this is one look at the report that we get out. And you'll see this is just an example of Audubon, Audubon Downriver neighborhood and all the different colored dots. So the different colors correspond to different types of land cover. And uh, we've classified five different types, water in blue. Red is impervious surface. So that's buildings and roads and driveways and sidewalks. The brown is bare soil or dry vegetation. The dark green is um, other types of vegetation like uh, grasses and gardens and and low shrubs and ground covers. The bright green is tree canopy. The report <clears throat> gives us a, a percent cover of the land area. So this one from Audubon Down River shows uh, nearly 23% canopy cover. The other thing that this analysis does is brings us benefit analysis. It values carbon storage, it values uh, air quality benefits, and it values uh, stormwater runoff mitigation. So we get, we get a, a dollar value for the benefits. And we have this on a neighborhood, neighborhood by neighborhood basis. So then I went to, um, if you'll notice, what I've done is I've gone to a lot of different people and asked them to do a lot of different things, and um, it really came together beautifully. So I went to environmental programs and said, I have this, this fabulous data set. Can you make it look good using Power BI? And, of, of course, they did that for me. You see the image of the city there and the council districts one, two, and three and each of the neighborhoods outlined in white. The darker shaded areas have higher tree canopy cover. The lighter shaded neighborhoods have a lower canopy cover. And <clears throat> off to the right, you can see each neighborhood broken out by their percent tree canopy cover and the annual ecosystem benefits associated with that tree canopy cover. We pulled out the stored carbon benefit value because it is not an annualized figure. So we wanted to separate annual benefits from, from those that are not annualized. So um, at the, the bottom line there is uh, $5.7 million in ecosystem benefits per year across the city. But the, the um, distinguishing feature here is we're able to identify those particular neighborhoods that have greater need and greater opportunity for tree planting initiatives. So 
So that was super quick. Um, uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have about this. Yes, Angel, this is Jerry. I have a couple questions for you. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, within this ranking, uh, where is our city proper located within your numbering and your diagrams? Downtown. Okay. Where is our what? The proper section of downtown city. Oh, Riverside neighborhood. Riverside neighborhood. Okay. Uh, within That's right that, in the center. You can see that light area right in the in the center. Uh, yes. Okay, got it. All right. What did we discover there? So Riverside is 7.8% uh, canopy cover. Okay. What within this also? Um, you know, you said you can assess care and maintenance and that type of thing. So um, within the city proper, did anything resonate that was not being cared for at this time or that we need to address? This uh, this does not uh, provide information about, about care and maintenance. Okay. It, it provides information about canopy density as a as, uh, percentage of land cover. Right. But I guess what I'm getting at right now, and I'll just spit it out, uh, we have a variety of trees within our city proper, if you will, that are dead and not getting watered, uh, not being taken care of, uh, which brings me a, you know, pointed and great concern. So uh, hopefully this new assessment uh, will be something that we as a board will be able to appreciate and understand a little bit more uh, as you continue with this study. So that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will say before we can, um, well, rather than putting every effort into adding to and growing our canopy, the very first thing we need to do is preserve and protect um, the health and condition of the, of, the, of the tree canopy that we have. Yes, absolutely. That's why I brought it up. Any other questions? Okay, Th thank you, Angel. That was for me. That was very enlightening when I, at our meeting, and that's why I asked you to go ahead and bring it up at the park board meeting. No, okay, I think also at the. Go ahead. Ray. Also at the, okay. Also at the park board meet or the urban forestry meeting, for our citizens advisory committee, Matt gave an update on the citizens advisory committee, and the projects they are working on of the seating giveaway program and the Lance Council and a piece about hiring a qualified arborist for tree risk assessments after the windstorm. And then Katie provided an urban forestry update which included storm cleanup and restoration efforts. There's a new part-time administration assistant has been assisting with office duties, a chainsaw safety course is being formalized with a safety team and provided information about the hillside landslide impacts to, tra to trees at Elm and Clark. Um, and there was no financial report available at this time. Our next meeting will be March 30th at 415 and maybe in person and maybe by WebEx. We don't quite know yet. And that's all I have for urban forestry. Thank you, Rick. And again, Angel, thank you. And thanks to Gonzaga students for us for such great work. I think it really helps to have that visual picture of the neighborhoods and the districts. Um, that, that's really outstanding. And that kind of data will be useful to us for a long time. Thank all you. Right. I just to, can I, Jennifer, can yes, I mention yes. another thing about the students? Um, uh -huh. They are working on their final report for the project. And they've already booked two presentations for that. So they'll be presenting. Uh, to the uh, planning department staff um, at some point in the future, and also to the natural resources work group of the sustainable action subcommittee of city council. So they are booking presentation appointments pretty quickly. Excellent, excellent. I love this kind of partnership. That just makes everything better. So super, thank you. And All I would right. also like to offer my thanks 
Jennifer, to yes. Angel and the Gonzaga students. Uh, I think this can become a, a really valuable tool for us, you know, as we move forward with uh, the information that we're going to gain from them. Uh, just, it will give us some answers that I think we've all been looking for. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Well done. All right. Well, since Jerry, you're, uh, you're next, go ahead and keep talking. Golf Committee. All right. Let me unmute. Uh, before we begin, we do have a couple of action items for golf, but, uh, you know, I was remembering the other day that we often have uh, viewers that will uh, either come in by phone or, like Rick said, he's watching us now on TV. And sometimes we, or I, forget as a golf committee that we're doing things, and it just becomes rote, you know, as we move through the weeks and months and with all the things that are going on. So I thought before we start with uh, our presentation for action items, I would just like to cover, oh, I don't know, just a couple of things, kind of as a snippet. Uh, for the community at large, I think I would like to remind them that we do have four phenomenal championship golf courses within our city. And those golf courses fall under our park and recreation area. Um, right now, of course, uh, the quote we're looking at with the irrigation, we have uh, three golf courses that are prominent within our historic value, if you will. And any of us at any time can research, you know, when they started, their origin, and uh, how long they've been in play. Uh, but we also have one golf course that's called Qualchen, and that one I kind of refer to as a fledgling. Walton did not open until 1993, which I had forgotten because, you know, we had left the city and uh, were gone for quite a while. Uh, but one of the things that uh, we're focusing on today are the irrigation systems. And when we first started, we started with Indian Canyon golf course. And at Indian Canyon, uh, there are a few little anecdotes, one in particular, uh, at Indian Canyon, you know, we thought that we had uh, a beautiful natural stream that ran through Indian Canyon. Well, <laughs> it really wasn't natural. Uh, one of the irrigation uh, connections, if you will, was not connected. So over the years, we have been losing, uh, and I'm going to say this word, but <laughs> we have been losing millions of gallons of water, not just at Indian Canyon, but at some of our other courses too. But I, I thought that one was, was most interesting. Uh, the second course that we just completed was Esmeralda. And Esmeralda, when it was set up, you remember the Rotary Group, if I remember, and Hal, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but the Rotary Group, I think, was the one that really initiated that one. And uh, that type of irrigation system had to do with some sort of an antiquated layout. And the other thing that was missing there was some of the far-reaching areas of the, the forest, if you will, at, at Esmeralda, was not even being touched. So now where we are today, what we are going to be presenting via Nick Hammond, our wonderful landscape architect, and coordinator of all of these processes and things that are taking place is Down River Golf Course. And Down River is an approach unique to itself. And remember now, it's nestled to down along the river. Once we get going over this year and finishing up next, uh, future things that we're gonna do in golf is to really keep track of the water usage and also how we partner in the city you know, with other entities, which Nick is going to share as he presents today. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of background of where we are and uh, what we have left for us to tackle. So with that, uh, Nick, I would like you to uh, begin the introduction, of you, if you will. On uh, We have two action items that will be presented separately. So thank you. Sure. 
Thanks for uh, teeing everything up there, Jerry. My name is Nick Hammett. I'm the landscape architect with Spokane Parks and Recreation. Um, here today to present to you um, the first action item, which is the Downriver Golf Course Irrigation Renovation Construction Contract. Um, you'll see two contracts today, um, which we recommend uh, approval of as staff, um, both related to Downriver Golf Course. And as Jerry mentioned, I believe the number is we've saved over 56 million gallons of water since we started these projects back in 2019. So pretty significant amount of water having uh, renovated just two courses. Um, we have received two bids for the Downriver Irrigation System, two qualified bids from two uh, irrigation contractors that are specialists in working on golf courses, which is really a unique set of skills, a uh, unique contractor. They're working very closely to uh, active golf play. 16 holes of these courses remain open at all times during construction, and so we certainly want to make sure we have a contractor on board who's used to that. Um, it's worth understanding that the, the funding source for all of the golf course irrigation projects we've done, the three, this being the third, in the last few years, come from a Spokane investment pool loan that was secured by the park board, I believe back in uh, 2016 or 2017, totaling seven and a half million dollars. In addition to that, uh, the utilities department allocated about $90,000 to the Esmeralda golf course project uh, for some, some utility work there uh, last year in 2019. And the park board a month or two ago accepted an agreement with the utilities department for, for about $409,000 uh, to allow a stormwater pipe across that uh, property at the same time as the irrigation system. So in total, we have about $8 million worth of project funding available. Of that budget, $2.33 million were spent at Indian Canyon, about 2.56 at Esmeralda. We spent about $271,000 or so dollars for all of the design work thus far, which leaves us with a budget of about $2.84 million remaining. Um, this is consistent with the initial recommendations that you see on the right side of your screen um, from the Park Board Strategic Golf Investment Task Force, I believe it was called back in 2016. Uh, and they recommended securing a line of credit a little bit more than what we ultimately secured and building at least one system a year over about four years. Um, we are on our third system now in a period of about four years. So we're tracking fairly closely to those initial requirements and we really never envisioned that we could get all three golf courses for seven and a half million dollars of staff. That's, that's a pretty incredible uh, value there. Um, of the $2.84 million budget for Downriver, we estimated about a $2.65 million project build based off our historical pricing. Our bid came in at $2.83 million, just under our budget available. Um, higher than we expected a little bit. And really, there are some extenuating market-driven circumstances that um, have raised that price. Um, the price of HPPE piping, the plastic piping we use in these irrigation systems has gone up 35% since January 1. And a big part of that um, is pandemic related uh, manufacturing delays. But in addition to that, the resin manufacturers that make this pipe are all located in Texas, in the United States anyways. And all of Texas froze, shutting these plants down. They're still down today. And so the price of this pipe has gone up we uh, experienced a little bit of that here with our bid process, but still within our, within our budget. Uh, there's some additional contract work that would need to be uh, secured as a part of this project, um, not directly associated with this contract, um, but there are often change orders associated with these projects. A little bit of communication wiring that'll be needed and certainly some tree mitigation work that's protecting the roots of our trees. That's a separate contract from this, but it's worth knowing for you today that there are some other contracts above and beyond this that are required to successfully complete these projects. These value of change orders and these other projects usually ranges between two and 5% of the total irrigation contract price. So that's between about 60 and $140,000 historically on our other two projects. Um, these funds will have to come from our, either our, our SIP uh, repayment uh, account that we have about a million dollars in today or uh, some other golf funds. And, and before we bring any of those contracts to this board, uh, we will recommend an appropriate funding source for those projects. But, but today, um, we are recommending contracting of the Downriver Golf Course Project 
using the SIP loan funds available. It does fit within the existing SIP loan funds. If the board approves the contract today, um, we would be looking to contract through the remainder of the month of March, maybe into April. We would bid in May our tree work contract. All of this work would not start until just after the Labor Day of this fall and continue into the spring of 2022. It would be required to be done by June 1 and we incentivize the contractor to be done a month earlier than that by the beginning of May. So that's our schedule. Um, and we recommend the award of the base bid for the project and alternate one. Alternate one is um, a per yard price for the removal of bedrock on projects. If we have to say hammer bedrock, we don't anticipate encountering any bedrock on this project, but with these projects, we're digging 90,000 feet of trench and you never know when you can run into those sort of things. So we want to approve that price as a part of this project. Um, we are not anticipating uh, awarding alternate two or not recommending that at this time. We've asked the contractor to hold that price for 90 days. It's about $30,000 and that's for a few extra heads at the Esmeralda Golf Course Project where we could really see the benefit from adding about 16 more heads. Um, again, we're not recommending the award of that today. If the budget's available later on, we feel that we could always bring that forward as a change order at that time. Um, and we plan to return to you in a, in a couple of months with a, a tree work bid um, for our arborists and some tree work associated with the project. Uh, are there any questions about the irrigation contract? Okay, I will uh, end my spiel and let Jerry make a motion. All right, thanks, Nick. And thanks for the extra pictures. I think the visuals are always always a little helpful. Um, you know, as a park board group and, and uh, people chiming in here, um, for viewing, it just, uh, I think, solidifies what it is you've been working so many months on uh, to bring this to this particular time frame. So with that, I move to approve Lexicon DBA Heritage Link Down River Golf Course Irrigation Renovation at $2,831,064.82 tax inclusive. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Bob. Any further discussion or questions for Jerry? If not, all those in favor, signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Good, good, good. Aye. Looks like it unanimously passes, and Chris Wright has joined us. Good to see you, Chris. All right. Aye. All right. Uh, very good. So that motion passes, and we're on to the second. All right, Nick, it's all yours. Sure. Uh, so this is a tandem project, or tandem contract, I should say, to the irrigation construction. Of course, when you have construction, you want to have somebody monitoring that construction. And this is something we typically employ our golf course irrigation design company to do. Um, they have experience in this sort of work, as do we, and we work together to, do, um, to oversee these projects. The contract amendment for the irrigation construction oversight is about 2% of the total construction price. So quite a bit lower than the construction oversight you'd see on a normal project. But then again, it's only the irrigation component. It's not building a landscape, so to speak. And so um, it's typically a little bit less than that. Uh, in the initial consultant proposal, we had contracted for design work on the golf course. That was considered phase one of his work. Um, this is phase two that we're recommending award of these construction services. This is really laying out the individual heads, where are they on the golf course is kind of a difficult thing to make sure you get right. And we don't want to just leave that to the contractor. We want to really GPS those in specifically and exactly where they need to go. Um, and we also employ this consultant to as build all of the conditions on the course, where are the pipes, where are the components, and to program our irrigation controllers in a way that make them easier to manage uh, long-term. We always uh, assume that irrigation controllers are automated and do this all on their own, but it really is a, uh, what we say, garbage in, garbage out. The better the information we can put in, the more precisely we can water, the more water we can save, uh, and the better the course condition. So this is a valuable service, uh, at least from a staff perspective. And so we would request um, that the board approve the ad services or amendment one 
uh, with irrigation technologies in the amount of about $54,000. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I think you covered it quite well. So with that, I would like to move to approve the irrigation technology, irrigation redesign at Downriver Golf Course, contract extension one for $54,655 tax inclusive. Jerry, I'll second that. This is Barb. Thank you, Barb. Any other questions for Jerry on this one or Nick? If not, I'll call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Raise a hand. Aye. Aye. Great. Great. Okay, good. And opposed? All right. Motion passes. Thank you, Jerry. Anything else, Jerry? Uh, just a couple little things. First of all, I just want to offer uh, a great deal of thanks to Nick and his team. You know, we have learned a lot from our beginning uh, at Indian Canyon and then progressing also to Esmeralda. And then I really appreciate Nick tagging on some things that we then discovered at Esmeralda because each one of these courses is so different that we never, we just never know, you know, what's going to happen and what will happen at the very end, especially finalizing things. And then you can read in the fine print if you take a look at things too, that uh, Nick is going to move, you know, quite a bit ahead of time here as far as uh, setting up our IT parks. If you all remember, we've got this gorgeous and wonderful irrigation system, but without the connections through IT, which is then taken care of by the city, uh, we really don't have the product up and running to, you know, to the extent that we need to have it. So I do appreciate that. At our meeting, we had a huge group of people. We had 18 people at golf. <laughs> it's because of you, Jerry, and Bob. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I just want to thank Mark Buning and Megan. Uh, they came to uh, support us with some financial things that, that Mark Poirier had put together, uh, you know, because we're embarking on some new things. And, you know, Megan, uh, we personally invited her back. When we become, like Barbara said, we're going to be gone with virtual donuts, we'll actually be in person. So that was a great thing. But anyway, course openings, uh, we have a variety of courses that are uh, in process right now. And weather permitting, Indian Canyon usually is our last course to open. Believe it or not, we still have snow up in that neck of the neighborhood. So we're, you know, a little bit slow getting started there. We also covered uh, some concerns that we have. We had some theft uh, situations that took place a few weeks ago. So we are working uh, to see how we can mitigate that particular entity uh, problem, if you will. Um, and then... Uh, the majority of the superintendents were there and the pros, and they just <clears throat> brought us right up to date as to what was going on. So anyway, with that, golf will be meeting next month at, uh, well, I don't know. I don't even want to say why back to Barb. <laughs> and we'll be meeting um, on the uh, 6th of April at 8 o'clock in the morning. So thank you all. Hence the need for donuts. I think the donuts yeah. make that committee so popular. All right. Well, we will move on to land committee. Thank you, Jerry. And hello, Greta. Hi. Uh, land committee met on March 3rd, and I think we may have broken a record for the shortest land committee meeting in a long time anyway. Uh, we had no action item. We had one discussion item, which was... Uh, Master side agreement for Vista Electrical Vehicle DC charging station. Uh, so that will likely be coming to the full board sometime in the future. We had standing report items. Carl provided information about the windstorm damage cleanup and how hard park staff has been working on tree removal and stump grinding, et cetera, and the things that they've done to. Um, save some money on the cleanup um, and how hard everyone's worked on the cleanup, which is very um, apparent if you uh, walk by Comstock and compare it to how it looked about a month ago. Uh, Nick Hammond presented a parks planning update. 
Um, the North Suspension Bridge Renovation Project is out to bid. And as he discussed, the Down River Golf Course Project is out to bid, but it must come in. Um, oh, or, and then the uh, Parks and Open Space Master Plan project is starting again with a kickoff meeting uh, the week of March 14th. And um, the Manitoba Park Japanese Garden Pond Restoration Project is starting soon, and that Japanese garden will remain closed until June. And the next land committee is meeting is 3.30 p.m. on March 31st, and I believe that will still be uh, via WebEx. Thank you, Greta. Sally with Recreation. Well, okay, so Greta had the shortest in history. We had the longest. <laughs> Made up for it. <laughs> um, I just want to say what a, what an amazing evening through 7 o'clock or something. Mm -hmm. And um, But we had, uh, I, I want to thank Jennifer and Josh for all the work they did in um, presenting to us and then the rest of the committee for all the discussion. I think what's being presented is really the best scenario and really appreciate everybody's uh, robust conversation and really productive. And it was um, the longest, I think, in history. But uh, for that, we're, we have to take the next month off because we're still recovering. But um, so I don't have any I don't have anything to report. I think that's going through Bob in finance. Um, I think he's presenting that today and uh, rec committee will not be meeting in April. Thank you, Sally, and yay team uh, for all the hard work that you went through to bring this action item, which will actually go through finance indeed. All right, so Nick has asked me to present for Riverfront Park Committee today. He's multitasking with work at the moment. And uh, we began the Riverfront Park Committee meeting with an effort that Halma Glathry and Chris Wright have been bugging me about since I think November. Um, and that is the proper way to commemorate King Cole for all of his contributions uh, toward Expo, bringing Expo here, convincing the locals that Expo was possible, convincing, convincing the national committees that Expo was possible here in Little Spokane, and really transforming what was not very attractive downtown with all the railroad trestles and depots and refinery and all of that sort of stuff into this beautiful riverfront park that we have. I can't imagine a downtown transformation like that in any city in the country. It really was extraordinary. And so we began the meeting with uh, announcing or sort of introducing a res resolution to um, provide appropriate recognition for King Cole in Riverfront Park. And some of you know that the uh, bridge uh, is named for King Cole, but that's, that's not widely known and not much talked about and it's thought that we need to do a little something more. In discussing the resolution, it was discovered, or it was the opinion of the committee, that the resolution in some ways tied our hands in terms of the variety of options we could have for commemorating or finding a way to recognize King Cole. And so rather than endorsing the resolution, we endorsed the beginning of a process for uh, finding the appropriate recognition mechanism and leaving that really open to all kinds of possibilities, whether it's statues or naming rights or displays that are educational or what have you. And so the motion that you have in front of you today is to the, approve the establishment of an ad hoc committee to evaluate all these different scenarios and recommend appropriate recognition for King Cole within Riverfront Park. So that's the, um, the motion that we have. And I would Move that and ask for a second. All right, Sally has seconded. Any discussion or question on this motion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Great. Aye. And opposed? All right, uh, both Hal and Chris are here, and I want to thank you for your hard work. We did notice in the committee's discussion that we we're going to use the meat of that resolution as a sort of guideline for uh, how we're going to proceed through the process. We just wanted the process to be a little more open-ended in terms of possibilities. But Hal has been on the ground talking with people and getting enthusiasm from the community, including knowing who 
sort of, I want to say old timers, but the experienced and seasoned people are in this effort. And um, and Chris, of course, has been in there with his legal beagle mind and, and helping to craft this in an appropriate way. So it's great to have you all as a part of that team. I hope you'll be part of the ad hoc committee and uh, we'll, we'll be joined by staff and park board members. So thank you for your efforts there. The uh, second, the Big Belly Solar Amendment number three for refuse and recycling receptacles. Do we have a staff person that was going to mention anything about that? Barry, were you going to say anything? Nope. Okay. Uh, so, Jennifer, I think that's John Moog. And, oh, is that John? John, is that you? He's on. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he's hearing me. Hello, John. Maybe he's not hearing me. Sometimes he has bandwidth issues. Uh, okay. Well, well, I am sorry. I am having bandwidth okay. issues. Yeah, you're breaking up. So um, I have the language here, John, if you'll allow me. Um, this is an amendment for the last edition for the Big Belly Refuse Recycling Units, providing three of them for the North Bank and two for the Pavilion. So the motion is to recommend the Riverfront Park Big Belly Amendment, and that's a trash can, folks. That's, that's what we're basically talking about. Uh, number three, for refuse recycling receptacles in the amount of $11,680 plus tax. So that's the motion. Do I have a second? How could I not second the Big Belly? Um, <laughs> Barb is Barb. Yes, thank you, Barb. Any questions about that? I'm seeing a good thumbs up for John. All right. Well, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. Aye. All right. Good. Any opposed? Well, the uh, on behalf of the maintenance staff, we like to keep the parks clean. Thank you for the trash can. All right. Motion passes. And then we have La Riviera North Bank Playground Change Order Number Ten, Barry. Ah, oh, thank you, Jennifer. And I'm so happy to be here with you. Uh, this should be the probably the second to last change order on this North Bank project. Um, anything that comes after this uh, is probably little incidental items, but we have um, we've worked really hard to get to the end, and with COVID and whatnot, um, you know, trying to trip us up along the way. Uh, we have. And I'm going to share my screen with you. Rather large change order, but it's been negotiated over the last several months. Um, and it has gone back and forth uh, between our contractor and, and me. I've, I've presented this to two committees, uh, the uh, executive team and also the Riverfront Park Committee, uh, which have both voted for approval. Um, it basically exhausts, I should say, um, our budget up on the North Bank, which is exactly where we wanted to get to. We wanted to, 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 to use our budget up there and, and get to a, a zero number um, for all of our improvements and not leave any money left on the table uh, at North Bank. Anyway, the first part is our, is our splash pad. And we had some changes associated with our splash pad because it was an added feature since the bid time, uh, at least the recirculation part. Um, zooming in, uh, you'll see on the site map here, which I, I hope you can all see, um, and then the aerial of the site, this is where the, the, the changes actually happened. And it's from value added items. Uh, we added the Ross Kelly boulder in this area. We added uh, the actual recirculation pump in this zone. And then we also added some lighting and whatnot. You can see some tanks over here. These are just the lids. I mean, these are ginormous tanks underground, thousands of gallons. Um, but we needed to manipulate the, the landscape around it. And then, of course, um, navigate with the uh, uh, Spokane Health Department, which uh, is no easy regulatory authority to get through. Um, but anyway, there, there, there are um, many changes that are, that, that are wonderful here, mostly landscape, little bit of, of, uh, of, of plumbing. 
Um, the next item is our uh, is sod versus feed. When we when we bid this project, we had hydro seed being placed everywhere where we have lawn, and that was a a budget concern for us. We didn't know if we were going to be able to afford it, but I think that we can actually afford to have 50% or so, at least the, the, the high impact areas shown in this um, um, uh, boundary here as being hydro seed. Um, one thing I want to tell you about on, uh, on the site plan is that all the green that's shown up here and all the green that's shown here is is resilient surfacing. So it's it's uh, it's already been uh, bought and, uh, and or, or or landscape already. The only areas where we would have hydro seed are right around the base of the butterfly, and then also uh, this zone down here, which is really just a, a big sloped area uh, next to a parking lot. I think that we can heal that that sawed in, or I should say hydro seed in, relatively easy, a little bit of orange fencing around it, just to protect it. But for the most part, all of our active areas right away get sawed and people can, uh, and especially children can run and have fun there. Um, also, there's some canopy lighting. And in this image, I can show you the restroom uh, facilities that we have. You can see four doors here. Uh, three of them are family restrooms, and I also had um, incorporated into the design several, you can't see the one up on the very top right, uh, area lights that shine down in this, in this zone, um, but it was really, it felt necessary to get a little bit of illumination underneath this canopy, that not only helps folks see it and feel more comfortable, but especially our uh, park rangers to be able to have this illuminated and 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 be able to monitor this uh, really easy. Another um, item we had was some uplighting that's on the bluff and at our main entry. And with that, uh, I'll just scroll a little bit. And feel free to stop me at any time. I, I, I tend to talk really quickly about these. Um, but I love to chit chat about all the details. So if you need to um, stop me, um, we gave the contractor a bunch of these up lights, uh, five of them. And what the uh, installation details, of course, uh, include is a J box. And you can't just put, a, per the installation detail, a J box underneath underneath the light. You, you have to have it in, in a box adjacent to the light. So the, the, the electrical connections, so that they're watertight, so that they're accessible, they go adjacent to uh, the light fixture itself. And then we wanted to add um, also some gravel underneath these lights. Um, and that helps with drainage and longevity so that they don't ever fill up with water. That was another item on this, on this change order. Um, one other item is pull strings. And Pull strings might be foreign to some of you, um, but we have our M&O facility, uh, maintenance and operations at this location. It, it also is the hub for our distribution of communications, meaning um, for sound, uh, for IT connectivity, so on and so forth. Um, and our promenade has communication cables that came up to this location. I hope you can see that. And then, and then they shoot over to the O and M facility. Well, this leg, for whatever reason, wasn't specified to have these pull strings. And what the pull strings do is that you vacuum those through the, the conduits, and then you're able to hook on uh, to your fiber or to your other wires and draw those pull them through to the destination. Anyway, it wasn't in the in the plans. Should have been implied. I argued with the contractor. We got it reduced to half. Um, so that's the pull string item. Uh, there was some grading over by uh, the base of our butterfly, and in this uh, view, you can pretty much see where we added or moved some soil, and this was to save some money. Um, 
the big push was to save some money. The other part is aesthetics and being able to hold up the slope of the switchbacks that are coming down from the new podium project. And in the scene, uh, you can see how the podium is also uh, grading their switchbacks too to their main entry. And then uh, this um, very gentle ramp uh, comes down and lands on our promenade. Uh, this gentle slope here will be uh, hydroceded and then also um, a little bit of mulch, but eventually a uh, project that is just uh, getting going again is called uh, the Papillon, or I think that's French for butterfly, will be started here. And then they will um, uh, propose an access through this area to get to our promenade. Uh, so this land will be manipulated again. However, um, they'll propose how to manipulate the earth in that zone. Saved us a lot of money. Uh, then there's some curb marking. And this is an image from our parking lot, from our main entry. Uh, in the uh, background, uh, you can see the intersection improvements at Washington and North River Drive. And what we see here is one of our, it's actually one of our trucks that are sitting in the driveway and they're parked uh, right here in our entryway. And we, John Moog brought this up to me and he said, Barry, if there's going to be cars parked here, we're going to have a problem with ingress and egress. Uh, we need to be able to get folks in quickly and exit them quickly and let them know that there is really no parking in this zone. So uh, for a small fee, I think it's $300 or so, I asked the contractor to paint this curb red and then also from this end out to the street, which indicates fire lane, um, which it really is a fire lane. Uh, we have to have emergency access in and out of here. Anyway, paint those curbs red, no parking. Um, unfortunately, we did have some more soil disposal uh, that we had to do. Uh, part of this is covered by our, by our EPA grant, but I needed to get um, I needed to get some soil removed from our site so that we could button up for the winter and then um, pave in the spring. Come here real soon. On the site plan, uh, there is a little area south of our main parking lot, right in the zone, uh, that, that that has asphalt that goes right out into our trail system along the river. And this asphalt is actually intended for our tour train to come into the site. This is how we designed it, um, you know, whenever that happens. And then the tour train would come around, uh, make, a, make a turn, of course, uh, come to the drop-off zone, and then be able to head back out of the site. Uh, the, the way it came in, but folks could could mistake that uh, as a as a way to exit uh, out of the uh, out of the parking lot. So what I asked the contractor to do was to take this 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 concrete sidewalk here along this way and extend it um, just to make this one continuous sidewalk. And then what we would do is put some planters in here or um, some other obstacles, decorative, of course, um, to make that a little more difficult for people to move through um, in their SUVs and whatnot, uh, but still our park uh, vehicles can move through. So that was uh, one other ad that I asked the contractor to do. And then a Vista came back. We have a transformer. It's behind our fences over by our m and building. They asked Barry, we got to have these bollards in there. It's our standard. I can't get away from it. Please install these bollards around this transformer. Seemed unnecessary, but you know, in order to protect the transformer, we don't want anyone bumping into it. If that happens, um, we're liable. So. Uh, the, the other, that item is for dollars. Um, and then there's this bone sculpture and you'll see I crossed it out to zero. 
what we negotiated with the contractor is to take the old Dino bone from Expo. It's actually an art piece. I don't think that the artist ever intended it to be thought of as a dinosaur bone, but it looks really cool and it makes great yard art. Um, we had negotiated with the contractor to seal up all the cracks, to whitewash um, and, and apply some graffiti sealer. Anyway, um, as we went through the process with them, they said, you know, we'll just take care of it. So no charge. We'll take care of it. I want to make sure that the, um, the scope, though, is in this change order. They're, they actually committed to it, even though it's zero dollars. So it's an added scope item, but at the um, uh, goodwill of the contractor, which is T. Riviere, wonderful outfit that's building our, our North Bank project. The other item is general conditions. And I want to just let you know that this is an expensive item. And general conditions with a contractor is, is to have staff on site, uh, labor, people actively on site, eight hours a day, plus or minus, um, and equipment, watching the job, overseeing the um, uh, subcontractors and whatnot, and I needed this to happen because our schedule got elongated. We were supposed to end in November, but due to some challenges in, in, in 2020, we needed to run this contract through the winter and, and, and end at the end of April. So I need these folks on site. Um, uh, also, it comes with a, a, a trailer. They need a place to work out of. Um, and then, of course, this, the, the, the support that goes along with that. And then, um, of course, our, our construction fencing. So these things cost money. Um, I negotiated with the, with the contractor for about uh, four months worth of, of general conditions. And it comes with, with uh, uh, support back at their main office as well. Um, this one... Uh, we call it PCO 67, uh, which is a potential change order, uh, and until it's approved by you, it's potential. It doesn't become a change order. But this is for what's called a PRV valve, uh, a pressure reducing valve. And what it does is when there's a lot of water uh, pressure in a, in a system, that's pressing up against a valve, it's, it, it's, relative, it's static, it just sits there. And then, and then you open the valve, and the water starts moving through. And some of our some of our pipes are two inches uh, in diameter, which moves a fair amount of water, 18, 20 um, gallons per minute through there. And then when you shut off those valves, like let's say in a uh, a faucet, a toilet, um, any of our other fixtures, it 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 abruptly stops and there's a hammer and there's a vibration and it can break. And so what I asked the contractor to do was install this pressure reducing valve, um, which looks something like this. And, and really all it does is reduce the static pressure of the water so that when it flows, uh, it, it, it gently moves. And then when it stops, it gently comes to a close and it adds to the longevity of our, uh, of our plumbing system in the, uh, in the maintenance and operations building. Uh, the other item was a roofing, this is a credit, this is money back. Uh, we made a, just a little change on the width of the panels, the steel panels that make up the roof. So we got some, some credit back on the labor that it took to install that roof. And then there was a, a, a fencing credit and that's here. We had the fence just a little bit lower than, than what we had originally spec'd. We used some of that money to help armor the, uh, the baseboards inside the warehouse of the M&L building so that when we bump up against it or we hit it hard with carts or whatever, vehicles, um, that the, the walls of the building are, are, are better um, uh, protected. The last item is a sales <laughs> sales tax credit. And this is uh, for many past change orders that we have offered the park board for approval. Um, our calculations were a little off 
in the past. And then we went back and revisited these and made sure that it was correct. And so that's what the last one is. And of course, um, as, uh, as, as George Harrison would say, you, know, um, uh, you take one, um, they take 19 or so. Um, with that, this is change order number 10 for La Riviere on the North Bank. It is a, a fair amount of money, $154,299. Uh, dollars and 54 cents and it brings the total contract value up to about 9.5 million for six uh, point uh, you know some change of park, uh, park improvements and I would appreciate your support to move this forward. Thank you Barry and this does use up our contingency on the North Bank does it not? It does. It does. We're at the we're at the end of the uh, of the budget. All right. So the motion would be for La Riviera North Bank Playground Change Order Number Ten, the amount of one hundred and fifty four thousand two hundred and ninety nine dollars and fifty four cents, tax inclusive with the funds to come from administrative reserve and project contingency. Yes. And a second. I'll second that. Thank you, Jerry. Any further questions for Barry? Discussion? Greta, did you have anything? I see you're unmuted. No, nope. just getting ready. To... Just getting ready. All right. <laughs> I, just, I just have one, Jennifer. Yes, Jerry. That's a big one. Because, thank oh, you, Barry. Okay. So, you spend hours and hours on minuscule things, and you have the eagle eye. And, I mean, just finding all those things. Uh, Beyond value engineering. So, <laughs> anyway, I just thank you, Jerry. Kudos, to all your work. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, we're going to have to find a way to keep Barry in some capacity. All right. Yeah. So, we have a motion on the table. I'll call for the question. All those in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? All right. Motion passes. Thank you, Barry. And so the last part of the Riverfront Park Committee meeting, except, of course, for John Moog's presentation on how things were going, uh, was that Amy Lindsay had a great sponsorship presentation, which Nick and I agreed should be offered to the park board, because as you're out and about in the community, um, you may hear or find opportunities for people to help sponsor what's going on in Riverfront Park. And this just provides you that knowledge and that information to move those pieces when it's necessary. So, Amy Lindsay, can you take it away, please? Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Jennifer. Can you hear me okay? Great. I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, Today, I just wanted to go over, on, in addition to the sponsorship opportunities, I wanted to provide a little bit of insight into our community engagement programming for the year, all of the great things that we have planned for the community at Riverfront Park. And also, um, as Jennifer mentioned, um, I want to talk a little bit about how we work with potential sponsors from a programming perspective and from a marketing and advertising perspective. Um, and give you some insight into how we value our assets at the park and uh, our valuation and pricing process. And then um, ultimately, our board members are, are uh, stewards and champions of our parks, and you're out there uh, talking to other community uh, leaders about our initiatives and our programming efforts. So really just wanted to provide you with as much information as possible and um, some insight into how we work with our, our paid sponsors at, at Riverfront and, 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 and Parks. Um, so our goal is to really um, give you that information and hopefully um, you, know, you might be willing to make introductions and you'll know exactly how, how this all works um, from a sponsorship standpoint. So this is just a, I'm gonna go through these really quickly, but this is just uh, what we're planning, uh, our programs and, and events for 2021. And we have it separated by season. So we're going to kick off the spring with our Riverfront Moves um, fitness activity with Hoop Town that starts next week. It's on Tuesdays. And Riverfront is the umbrella um, uh, brand for all of our fitness activity at Riverfront, whether it's yoga on the bridge or 
um, or bar at the ribbon or stand at the pavilion. Um, so uh, lots of other things also happening um, this spring. And the summer we will be, uh, we're already starting to plan our drive-in fireworks event with the county and the school and the Indians. Um, we will be doing our uh, Riverfront Eats Food Truck Festival. We work on a fall festival with a DSP. Um, we have our summer concert series coming up, um, movies in the pavilion, a roller glow at the pavilion, which is a roller skating under the pavilion lights. So we're excited about the potentially uh, bringing those activities to the park, uh, sponsorship pending, most of them. And then our winter market and winter programming and activation will look similar to what we did in 2020. Um, where we'll be uh, bringing back our very successful winter market at the pavilion and um, also our trail of lights. We're hoping to light up Riverfront with all the beautiful Christmas lights, welcoming people back. Hopefully we will be, we'll be in phase four or COVID will be a thing of the past by then. We'll see. Um, but numerica tree lighting is also part of that. And um, that's kind of just a quick overview of what we have planned from a programming standpoint. But how we work with our partners, um, there, every partnership is really customized based on what our partners are looking to do and accomplish. And again, it's a marketing transaction. Um, they're paying for advertising at, at the park and integration with, with our brand and association with our brand. So that includes on-site promotions, um, year-round presence potentially at the park through displays and signage. Uh, media is an important aspect of that. Cross promotions, recognition, and of course our marketing collateral on social media is most so important um, these days. Hospitality and special events. Uh, we work with partners on providing potentially attraction tickets or concert tickets and complimentary venue rentals, and then just other grassroots marketing initiatives that um, we we would work with them directly on, but that they may have an ideas for ideas for. This is just an example of some of the some of the things we've done and with our, our paid sponsors. Um, we have a new uh, Pavilion Light Show sponsor, and that's TDS Fiber. So um, they are not only they're not just paying to have their logo on our promotional collateral online, but they're, this includes an on-site element. So it gets um, the company in front of their potential customers, which is exactly what they wanted to do. And there's some other elements uh, with that agreement as well. Free carousel rides is another way that we um, partner with sponsors where this is one Spokane Federal Credit Union um, offered free carousel rides for the community and um, they pay for all of the tickets. So um, they, they fund this activity and then they pay a booth fee. And um, this, is, this is a great added value and benefit for the community as well as our, as our sponsor. Uh, historic tours was something that we worked with um, with Humana, and so Humana was one uh, partner that wanted to um, get in front of um, a older demographic, seniors, and historic tours was something that we uh, would set up in front of, people would meet in front of the visitor center, they would meet at the Humana booth and learn all about their products and services, um, and that, that was a benefit to, to Humana. And then the July Carnival, uh, lastly, um, this, and these are just some, some very brief examples. Uh, VISTA sponsored our 4th of July uh, carnival and celebration um, a few years back by providing uh, free uh, family or discounted family day uh, for the carnival. So um, a little, just a little bit of insight into our sponsorship sales process. Um, really the, 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 big, uh, the big thing is understanding our partner's goals. So, uh, the first thing uh, out of our mouth is what are our, uh, what are your top three goals? That's what we want to ask them. And really then prioritizing that objectives from there. So we want them to define success. What does a successful partnership look like to them? We also establish benchmarks and um, we try to figure out how we can assist. How can parks assist, assist them um, with meeting their goals? All of our sponsors have different resources and assets and every everybody's uh, Everybody looks very different. So how can we help them uh, su succeed? Um, and then we're always evaluating our, our success and potentially refining our sponsorship programs and, and, um, and assets as needed. 
and we want to, we want our partners to be very happy. Uh, the way we value our assets is a CPM model. Um, this is, and this is pretty standard practice in the industry, in the sponsorship industry. So uh, typically, so a CPM is cost per thousand impressions, and generally, um, a ten dollars per CPM for a media mention is how you might value uh, a, a, a mention in the media. Five dollars would be per CPM is website recognition and social media recognition, a tag. That gets a little bit higher um, with a social media co-branded message because you're being very specific about a tent and usually you have a call to action. Um, Twenty dollars per CPM, that on-site activation, that on-site opportunity for the sponsor to be face to face with their potential customers is is very valuable and that's that's generally twenty dollars per CPM. So really, um, this is this is also market dependent. So um, New York City looks very different than uh, Spokane, but for the most part, these numbers are you know from an on-site perspective. But these numbers are very um, are, are industry standard um, and budget relieving assets. Also, uh, if that's part of the agreement, that could be services or products or cost savings. Those are typically valued for a dollar for dollar. So what we do with our partners, we always, after the, an investment, we provide a post-analysis report, which includes an ROI analysis. So we generally provide a packet that gives, uh, has shows pictures of the partners activating, uh, snapshots and reports from social media um, mentions and uh, um, their information on our website. But you can see how we, these are just all of the elements. This one was from actually our Manitou Lights um, sponsorships, which the initial investment was $5,000. And we've uh, itemized every promotional aspect that we've, we promised in the contract. So we know exactly how many impressions through KHQ the, uh, the, the, the TV ad um, um, experience. Uh, we know how many impressions the uh, Friends of Manitou event landing page had. So ultimately, we come up with a, the benefit based on this EM analysis which was 7,700, and of course, uh, we want the benefit to be higher than the initial sponsorship investment. And this, uh, the, the ROI for these particular uh, sponsorships were about 55%. So this is just a great takeaway for a sponsor to have. Um, it shows the value they can provide it to their leadership team, and hopefully they'll find a partner with us again. So um, again, um, you know, our sponsorship funds, uh, we're hoping to make connections here, and perhaps um, the board can help with introductions. You know where I am. But um, our sponsorship funds help support the park's legacy and our programming mission, um, uh, which is providing an added value and uh, elevated guest experience, and uh, really giving the community an, an informational, educational, entertaining, or cultural experience. And again, our partnerships are uh, highly customizable and are really developed to align with the Perks mission and fit our partners' strategic business goals. And this is me. You know where to find me. Um, I am more than happy to uh, talk to each one of you to dive into this in a little bit more detail if you'd like. But thank you for your time, and um, I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Very informative. So Riverfront Park closed with an update from John Moog, and I, I won't go into that for the interest of time. Suffice it to say that we can do more than we have been doing once we move into phase three, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, the next RFP meeting will be April 5th, and it will be at 4 o'clock, not 3 o'clock. I just wanted to highlight that. That's because of some work conflicts. So... Um, those of you who want to attend, make sure that if you're attending a committee meeting, you let Pamela know. Uh, we do need to sort of watch our attendance to make sure that since every committee has four members on it, make sure that if two people attend, we don't accidentally have a park board meeting. So do let Pamela know and kind of watch our numbers there. Help me with that. All right. We're going to move on to Finance Committee and Bob Anderson. Oh, Bob. I just thought I'd better unmute. <laughs> Uh, the Finance Committee met Tuesday, March 9th at 3 p.m., all committee members in attendance, and it was a WebEx meeting. We did have a action item, as 
Sally stated earlier, it, it started with the rec program or the rec, rec committee. And Josh and Jennifer gave us such excellent options. I think like little kids in a candy store, we started looking at all these options, asking questions, and all of a sudden it was seven o'clock at night and we, we set a record. So we asked Josh and uh, Jennifer to streamline it and come back with, with a different option or with a slightly different program, which, which they did. And they're gonna bring it to, they, they brought it to finance, it was approved and they're gonna make their presentation tonight. Um, so again, thank you for all your efforts, Josh and Jennifer and take it away. All right, thank you, Bob. I will start us out. I think that Josh is gonna share his screen. Here we go. All right, perfect. Okay, so um, we're doing a deep dive into aquatics. We tried to make this as punny as we could to, to keep it interesting. Um, so with phase one and phase two guidelines, it is allowing for aquatics facilities to reopen. And so I, what I hear is phase three will be coming soon. So we're excited about that as well. Um, what game community has been without outdoor community, has been without outdoor swimming pools for over a year. Um, and that just can't continue into 2021. So we believe that it is fundamentally important to provide learn to swim programs and access to our aquatics facilities for our community. Historically, parks permit revenues have supported subsidized programs like aquatics. However, this year that we're still in the pandemic, we're still not at pre-COVID-19 levels of revenue. That has a lot to do with us following the reopening guidelines. So we're not able to offer all the programs that we typically do and the programs that we do offer have limited capacity, which affects our revenue generation. Spokane Parks and Recreation is confident that in 2021, the Parks Fund has the capacity to support a fundamental or foundational service model approach for aquatic um, within its own budget. Keep in mind that this foundational approach is not ideal. We realize that it's ultimately also not where we want to be for the season of 2021, but this is much more than we offered last year as we offered zero last year for swimming. And we wanted to provide an approach that we could offer with no other outside funding sources, um, but also an approach that we can build on if outside funding sources become available. And we hope that they will. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Josh. He has done such a phenomenal job with this presentation and he is going to talk us through all the regulations, the guidelines and the approaches that we have um, moving forward. So thank you, Josh. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I'm part of a really awesome team and I enjoy all the work we've done together. Uh, and thanks Park Board for letting me present to you tonight. So in all of our phases of our goal, our, all of the phases that we've been going through with our aquatics reopening plan, our, our goal has always been to develop, uh, coordinate a safe reopening strategy for our aquatics facilities to provide an equitable space for all benefiting the emotional and physical health of our community in a fiscally responsible way. Um, some items I'm gonna cover tonight is what the COVID opening protocols, protocols are for phases one and two. Um, we do not have any provisions for what phase three looks like at this point, uh, but at least right now we know if we, if we end up going back to phase two, um, what our plan, uh, what, what we have to, plan around. A foundational service model, like Jennifer said, I'll show you that. And then what the financial impact is and possible opportunities moving forward to summer. So right now, currently water recreation facilities are allowed to open in phase two. Um, we would need to cover a few bases before we're able to open. We need to develop a comprehensive strategy plan to include COVID-19 exposure control, mitigation, and recovery. We need to ensure that there's six foot minimum physical distancing required for all activities for patrons and for staff alike. People of the same household may occupy, it may occupy the same lane or section of the pool. People from outside of households, we'll, we'll ask them to physically distance. Uh, implement other prevention measures such as barriers to block sneezes and coughs where physical distancing is not possible. 
We'll continue uh, using face coverings such as uh, masks and cloth coverings. These are required at all times at aquatics facilities. Uh, face coverings may be removed when people are in the water and maintaining that six foot physical distance. Aquatics facilities right now all need to be appointment based reservation only. And so building a reservation appointment only um, platform within our civic rec that we currently utilize for adult lap swim and open swim. And we'll need to follow uh, capacity restrictions, which currently for our facilities, they're set for a 50 people maximum. And then there's specific guidelines around specific programming, programming that we offer. So I just wanted to cover some of that. Uh, for swim lessons, we're allowed to continue to offer our learn to swim programming. We just need to make sure that we're uh, six feet of physical distancing maintained during the lesson for each participant. Uh, per instructors must wear a face shield with a cloth covering attachment if they need to provide close contact to uh, support swimmers in the water and they need to limit time that they're in close contact, uh, a maximum of five minutes for each student per lesson. And often we could have a uh, parent led uh, swim lessons with the instructor on the deck if, if we wanted to. Lab swimming and swim team, they can have up to two people in a lane at the same time, uh, pre-registration will be required. For swim team practices for competitive swimmers, uh, they're allowed up to four swimmers per lane. No two swimmers are allowed to be within six feet of each other during rest periods without a proper physical barrier between them. And swim meets are allowed as long as facility managers take extra precautions to hold these events safely. For open swim guidelines, we just need to make sure that we're staying within capacity restrictions for each facility. Uh, patrons will be free to move around the facility. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're ensuring physical distancing and that people of the same household are allowed to get together. But if you're not in the same household, we'll ask people to distance. And uh, pre-registration will be required for that program as well. Uh, it's important to mention that splash pad regulations. Uh, I've, I've gotten some information about our splash pads. Splash pads are able to open right now in phase one and phase two of Washington's reopening plan. Uh, they are permitted by the Spokane Regional Health District. And so right now they're uh, falling underneath the same umbrella that we permit our, munici our municipal pools in. And so to be able to operate our splash pads, we need to be reservation based. We need to have capacity maximums. Uh, physical distancing, face covering, sanitation schedule. And so with all of these restrictions on splash pads, uh, these factors make it very difficult to operate a splash pad. So at this time, we're focusing our limited resources on pools and free open swim and not planning to operate splash pads unless restrictions change. So like Jennifer said at the beginning, we have a foundational service model approach. Uh, we developed an aquatics program plan based on our core service model, a program plan that Parks Fund can confidently support with no outside funding sources, and with Learn to Swim programming being our top priority. So this is a, a very high level of what you can expect in the foundational services model. Um, we would operate Witter Aquatic Center for preseason adult lap swim and swim team rentals and a lifeguard training facility um, for the first uh, few weeks before we open. We would open at the same time for a regular season that we would in normal years. Uh, as soon as school let, lets out for Spokane Public Schools, we would open the Monday following their release, uh, which would be June 21st. For the first two weeks, we would be looking at prioritizing adult lap swim, aqueduct swim team, and swim lessons. And then over time for the next six weeks, after those first two weeks, for the next six weeks, we would be phasing in open swim uh, with one hour of open swim per facility per week. And that would round us out to a regular season of eight weeks, as opposed to a 10 week season that we've uh, done in the past. 
And then we would close out the season with uh, lap lane reservations and private swim team rentals at Witter Aquatic Center. And you can see the chart on the right, that's your uh, program offering frequency. Um, you can see that we are activating a lot of swim lessons. Um, that swim open swim time is, is very small. Uh, and then just kind of sharing between the two of lap swimming and swim team. So with our foundational service model financials, on, on this model, we are looking at a maximum visitor capacity in the season of almost 13,000 visitors, uh, a total staffing and operation cost of over just over 387,000. Our potential gross revenue would be a little bit over 143,000. It is important to note that uh, we would not be looking at charging for open swim in this, uh, but we do have plans to start charging for adult lap swimming of $6 per swimmer per hour. Uh, and so I've broken down the potential gross here uh, and you can see the breakdown and what lap swimming would bring in uh, if we charge that amount for those lap swimmers. And that would bring us to a parks fund investment of uh, a little bit over 244,000. And like Jennifer said at the beginning, this is, this is uh, an approach that we're hoping to build on. Uh, we want to have additional program investments outside of the parks fund and that would allow for us to increase open swim time, potentially turn things into a 10 week season or a nine week season, as opposed to a six week season we're looking at, or um, increase maximum visitor capacity. So this is the ultimate goal that we would like to see for the season. Um, we would still have that Witter Aquatic Center preseason in the beginning, same time, uh, still looking at having adult lap swimming, private swim team rentals at that time. And then starting the regular season at the, at the same time as our foundational approach, uh, but still having those first two weeks of adult lap swim, swim team and swim lessons be our focus. And then we would like to start phasing in open swim for the remaining eight weeks. So giving us a 10 week season and really expanding that open swim time to offering instead of one hour per facility per week, uh, looking at offering three hours of afternoon open swim sessions, six days a week at all six of our locations and two hours of evening open swim, three days a week at all of our locations. And then closing out the season again with uh, Witter Aquatic Center and the lap lanes uh, being rented by private swim teams and having some lap swimming for our adults. And then you can see our program offering frequency um, changes quite a bit with this plan. There's a lot more yellow in this plan than there was in the last one. There's a lot more open swim opportunity. And the financials for our uh, 2020, 2021 goal would be um, here. Here is your breakdown. We'd have a maximum visitor capacity of uh, almost 58,000 people. We'd have staffing and operating costs of just shy of 629,000. Our potential gross revenue would be um, a little bit over 202,000. And then our parks fund investment would be a little bit over 213,000 with a potential community investment um, of the remaining 213,000. Awesome job, Josh. Thank you so much. Uh, before we open it up to any questions that you guys might have, uh, just to kind of circle back, we are one also to touch on the max capacity. We're very hopeful that in phase three, those capacity numbers, those 50 people maximum, Per, per pool will go up. So hopefully we will be able to increase that maximum capacity for the season um, based on whatever the phase three guidelines are. So we're excited to see what those are. Um, 
Again, the foundational services model, we realize there is very minimal open swim, and we really want to extend on that. We want to make sure that these pools are accessible to as many community members as possible. So it's and hopefully when those opportunities present themselves for additional funding, um, we would love to build upon the number of weeks in the season, bring it back to a 10-week season, and increase that percentage of the pie of open swim so we can um, provide access to more of our community members. Great. Thank you, Jennifer and Josh. My goodness. Uh, I think Bob had a question about whether you guys are still going to be closed on Sundays. Yes. In both options, we are closed on Sundays. And um, Josh can speak to that a little bit as well, but it was basically a data-driven decision. Sundays are historically our lowest attended days of the week. Thank you, Jennifer and Josh. Any Questions, comments before we put this motion up for a vote? Garrett. First off, uh, Josh and Jenna rock stars. This is version 21 now. Um, I also just want to give the board an update as well with our conversations with the council. Um, and I can't thank uh, council member Cathcart and council president just for entertaining us to, you know, to come and present our this same information to the council. Um, their overall support to help us achieve our goal. Um, and so later this month, um, we'll be um, presenting a, a resolution to city council supporting the remainder um, amount um, of aquatics to the council here at the end of March um, because of the COVID and the effects that it's had on revenue and it's also the effects on the operation. So um, can't thank this partnership enough between the park board and council. This is um, a great partnership, and we all know that this is a very essential function for our community to rebound uh, this coming year. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. That is truly great news. If no further comments or questions, I will move that we endorse the initial 2021 aquatics investment and goal to expand operation as budget allows. Second. Thank you, Sally. All right, any, all those in favor, raise hands or say aye. 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 All, all those opposed? It is clearly passed unanimously. And again, thank you so much, Jennifer and Josh and your entire team. We put you through a lot to get there, but you did, so thank you. Um, to finish out the Finance Committee meeting, Mark Buny presented the 2020 year in financials and confirmed the success, successful completion of this most unusual year. Mark also presented January to February monthly financials that do depict some reduced revenue but op, and also operating expenses compared to 2020. And as he mentioned earlier, the COVID, in, the COVID impact didn't affect parks until March of 2020. As Finance Committee Chair, I want to thank the entire Parks team for your early analysis, detailed planning, and commitment to tough decisions that enabled Parks to have a successful financial year while replenishing our reserves. The next meeting is scheduled probably remotely April 6 to 3 p.m., but who knows, maybe we'll be down at Riverfront Park. And that's it. Thank you, Bob. Great work, everybody. Hard work, but really good work. I'm going to do a high-speed, low pass through the bylaws committee meeting because I know we're getting late. So, uh, very quickly, the bylaws committee me did meet, and uh, we're doing uh, the following actions. Um, and this is your first reading. We don't have an action. I well, we do actually I have an action item to add something to the text of what you have seen. Um, so, what we're doing in the bylaws is adding Joint Arts Committee and Development and Volunteer Committee as subcommittees in Section 16. There were some minor word edits and gender neutral language added. Uh, Hannah, our new legal beagle, and uh, uh, Chris, you've got a competitor there for being a legal star. Uh, uh, I don't know about that. 
Well, brought us up to date on, you sort of reminded all of us how amendments are made to the bylaws, and it turns out that was timely and really necessary because we, in fact, need to add a little bit to that. Um, and then, of course, we also added that we are going to be adding an emergency provision to temporarily suspend or amend the bylaws if necessary. And prior to COVID, I would never have thought that that was necessary, but evidently a planning commission has a, a, a little article to make a temporary suspension or amendment, um, and that's if there's an emergency that comes up. And we have learned this year that there can be national emergencies. So um, what I need to add to your reading of this, this first reading is language involving the quorum of a subcommittee meeting. That is not in the bylaws, and we um, need to do that because we actually this last week ran into a situation where RFP committee did not have enough attendees. The chair was not able to be present and several of the other appointed members. And even though we had extra park board members there, they couldn't be appointed by the chair who was absent to, to, to be voting members. And we didn't have a quorum. We didn't have enough people at all to vote. So we had to postpone the meeting for an hour. So we need to add that language of what a quorum is to the bylaws. So the recommended language is, and this will be added into your copy for the second reading when we actually adopt the bylaws next month. The recommended language is, that a majority of the committee shall constitute a quorum for conducting business for a park board standing committee. In case there is no quorum present on a day set for regular continued or special meetings, the committee members present may adjourn until a quorum is obtained or may adjourn said meeting specifying the time and place to which the meeting matter will be continued. Effectively, this is what we did with RFP. We postponed it for an hour until the people who were working could um, do this. So that's the language that I would like to add. And because I'm adding language to what you had in your reading, I'm going to make that a motion to add language that I just read to the reading of the bylaws for next committee. So that's a motion on this table. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Sally. Any questions? I'll call for the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, opposed? Thank you, everybody. I know bylaws is one of those necessary things. Uh, so, uh, and again, Hannah, thank you so much for updating us on, or just sort of reminding us, rather, how we can amend the bylaws at a park board meeting, because it turned out we need to do exactly that. So now we have the new development and volunteer committee, and Bob Anderson is the chair, and they did meet. Well, I guess I don't have a presentation for that, Jennifer. I'm sorry about that. Um, we did, the, the volunteer committee, development volunteer committee did meet. We discussed priorities. Um, the first priority is developing a, a Friends of Riverfront Park committee. Um, and then kind of take it from there where you, we tasked each other with looking at ways to you know, find, find members for this committee. Um, we talked about the various duties the people of Riverfront Park, the, the committee would do from fundraising to, you know, helping at events. And somebody suggested maybe they'd even want to pull weeds, you know, so there'd be lots of different um, activities for these members to do. Um, we discussed other options, um, looking moving ahead to the various other things we could do. And uh, I apologize, Jennifer, for not having a more detailed report on that committee. That's okay. In the interest of time, that was just right. So thank you for that, Bob. It is still in uh, development, and uh, I believe there are minutes of the meeting that you all can look at if you need to. We also did take a look at the text of a draft of a letter to invite people to be part of Friends of Riverfront Park. So that meeting, that meeting does not meet on a regular basis. But we will be letting you know, in accordance with the OPMA, when it next meets. So I'm going to segue right into my president's report, and um, I just have a couple of quick things. Number one, uh, please do let me know as we begin to enter into these phase three um, openings that uh, if you are uncomfortable meeting in person until you've had your vaccine or until certain circumstances are in place, let me know. I want to, I value uh, your input and um, I want to honor wherever you are in this. This is a crazy situation with COVID. So um, whatever your comfort level is, uh, that will be listened to. Please let me know if you have concerns. 
secondly, March 18th, there will be a special park board meeting. I wanted to remind everybody of that at 3 o'clock, and that's on the food contract, the concessionaire for parks. March 29th, we have a study session at 1 p.m., and that is on the parks and open space plan. So just reminding you of those items on your calendar. And finally, um, I can tell you that we're going to take a good hard look at urban forestry this coming year. We're going to dive down to the root of the problem and see what expectations are for planting trees, making sure that everybody's on the same page for protecting those assets. Uh, we're going to make sure we're not barking up the wrong tree on any of that and leave no leaf unturned as to what we can do to improve things. And uh, that would be the good thing to do, right, Garrett? So with all those puns, <clears throat> I'm going to quit there, but stay tuned for an urban forestry um, deep dive, as they say. So Greta, Conservation Futures. Anything to report? Uh, yeah, I do have something, something to report. We, uh, the Land Evaluation Committee for Conservation Futures met on March 3rd, and for those of you who don't know, I'm a member of that committee uh, representing the city of Spokane. And at that meeting, we took care of a couple items. Uh, one of them was we, um, we voted unanimously to recommend holding off on pursuit of any remaining properties on the 2016 Conservation Futures uh, prioritized acquisition list, excluding those that are actively under negotiation or contract. And the other thing we voted on is a schedule for the upcoming um, Conservation Futures um, nomination round and um, evaluation round. And the nomination period um, is May 1st through July 31st of uh, this year. Both of those recommendations need to be approved by um, park, county parks director and board of county commissioners, so they're not final yet, but that's what we did at our first meeting. And that's my report. Super. Thank you, Greta. I'm trying to see if we still have Barb with us. She had other work things come up or another meeting, and she is no longer with us. But the foundation report on accounts, I believe, was included in your agenda packet, so you can take a look at that. We did recently have a foundation meeting to take a look at how we move forward post-campaign, and that, those conversations will continue. That was just a, um, a conversation more than a, a committee meeting. All right. Uh, City Council, Council Member Cathcart, do you have anything to say? Hi there. Yeah. Uh, nope. No. No reports. But I just apologize for missing the first hour of the meeting. Had a medical appointment come up. But uh, other than that, nope. Just uh, nothing else to add. Well, we're glad for your participation here. And again, thank you for the role you've taken with supporting our aquatics attempts at reopening. And we we enjoy thinking about how we can do that more now that we're moving into phase three. So thank you for your help, Mr. Jones, Absolutely. Garrett Jones, Director. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you all. Um, not much to add, you know, other than just exciting news with phase three coming our way uh, March 22nd. We've already uh, had meetings on the books of looking into that transition. How do we communicate with the public on what we're doing in phase three? What does that mean for us financially and our programs and how we can continue to go in the right direction? And um, again, I think 2021 is, is it's not slowing down. It went, but the good news is we're continuing to move forward, which is important. So thank you all and have a great rest of your evening, end of my report. Thank you. All right. So is there anything else for the good of the order? If not, it's been a very long meeting, but we've gotten a lot done. Thank you, everybody, for your time and your patience. Have a great evening. A beer if you need one. Glass of wine. Well done. Thanks, everybody, and see you next Thank time. You, Jennifer. Thank you. Appreciate it.